guys, thanks for coming. Today I will be talking about river tanks. This is inspired by a tank I set up in the office of the Wainwright Lab a while ago that has sort of become one of my favorite tanks. And it's set up a little bit differently than we usually do fish tanks, so I thought I'd sort of explain how it works and why setting up a fish tank in this way. And um, Cool. Most of the work this is so most of the work we do in the Wainwright lab involves suction feeding. This is a Nile perch about to eat a poor little uh, bait fish. <laughs> and um, what the perch is doing is increasing the size of its mouth cavity so water rushes in and then the fish and the little bait fish in that area is going to be pulled into the fish's mouth. I'm not really going to talk about this today, I just wanted to show a video of a mouth for eating fish. They're really cool. So since most of you will not have the opportunity to own a Nile perch, which is for the best, they get like four feet long. Don't do it. It's not a good um, I'll show you. Today, is about replicating, in some ways, an environment that you see anytime you go to a stream. I'm calling these river tanks, but of course, a river has a multitude of different habitats. What I'm really focused on here is sort of shallow flowing streams with a lot of cobbles, something uh, with a lot of cobbles and, um, and sort of fast water flow. And the first question when we start to look at this is like, why set up a river tank to begin with? Like, why bother? Like, my existing tank is totally fine. Like, they do this. Well, uh, one reason is aesthetics. So when I see a properly set up river tank, that reminds me of collecting stickleback in Alaska or uh, British Columbia or Washington. And there's a lot of sort of clean, cold water. Like, if you have a setup built around like flowing water over smooth stones, it just sort of seems like clean inherent. And so, like, it can be a really nice, relaxing thing to look at. Which is funny, because it's not really relaxing for the fish. They're like fighting the current the whole time, but it's relaxing for the fish. <laughs> Another thing, which may be even more important, is that it can uh, setting up a river tank can let you look at natural behaviors. So fish that you <clears throat> never really thought were interesting or important before can sort of take on a whole new life when you place them in strong currents. And a lot of freshwater fish, maybe even a majority of freshwater fish in the trade, are actually found in flowing water and really appreciate it. Now I'm going to walk through sort of the elements of a river tank. We're going to talk about things you can put in, and then I'll show you two examples, one from a few years ago and one that I'm running currently. First thing you need for a river tank is a tank. And <coughs> that's, that's great, I mean, that's wonderful, but like what sort of tank? What lends itself to a good river yeah. tank? Well, what I've found is that you really want a tank with a large footprint. You don't so much care about the tank being particularly deep. You just want to have a lot of area to put cobbles and gravel and um, to give the fish a lot of areas to move around. River tanks, because of the way the flow works, can sort of change which areas in the tank fish tend to go to. And so you'll maximize the places the fish have available. If you have a tank that's either kind of long or a tank that's really wide, but tall doesn't really help you very much. And then you have your tank, that's great, you're going to put something in it. The substrate that works the best for river tanks is gravel. You can use sand, but if you have really strong flow, particularly from a powerhead, and I'll talk about that a little bit more, what will happen, and if you properly set up the flow in your tank, um, is that sand will start to blow away from the corners of the tank and pile up in other areas 
which happens in our river naturally. So a lot of these streams have larger rocks and gravel because finer sand is just washed downstream. If you want to find an area of river habitat with a lot of fine sand, you'll find that closer where the river meets the sea. So if you're looking to replicate something a little farther up with stronger flow, gravel gives you an easier time. There are some ways to make sand work, and I'll talk about those. In terms of decorating your river tank, river cobbles tend to be the way to go. River cobbles are also really easy to get in California. If you go to any landscaping store, you will be able to buy as many river cobbles as you want or probably not as much money as you expect. And I like ones that have sort of a bit of texture to them. Then those can be a little harder to find, but if you sort of have smooth rocks that were in a river at some point, you're doing it right. Driftwood can also be good, but Sometimes it's uh, it's a little harder to come by, uh, mostly because the typical aquarium driftwood is the sort of swampy Malaysian wood that produces a lot of tannins, which doesn't really help out this particular type of tank, and it doesn't really look like the sorts of driftwood you find in a fast flowing stream. If you get your hands on uh, manzanita, that works a lot better. Lighting. So. We'll talk about plants in a minute, and lighting and plants are sort of intimately connected. What I find with a lot of river tanks is you don't particularly need super bright lighting unless you want to have tons of algae for particular types of fish. But if you can have LEDs, it's probably a good thing because the motion of the water on the surface, which is going to be a bit stronger than your typical tank, will produce a really nice flickering effect <coughs> Sorry, a nice flickering effect that uh, looks really good and natural in a river tank, especially. So it doesn't particularly matter, um, but I sort of think LED lights look particularly good over river tanks. And that's what I think it means. In terms of filtration, pretty much anything works for a river tank, but you've got like, if the purpose is just filtration, you can use an internal filter, a hang on back, a canister. It doesn't really matter. You have to pay attention to where you put the inlet and the outlet. And I'll talk about that more in a minute. But even just a simple hang on back filter can be quite nice. And there's a modification you can do to make it even nicer out of the river tank that I'll talk about in a minute. The more important thing is not filtration, but water flow. Without high water flow, you don't have a river tank. And there's two main options for most of us. On the left hand side, I have a typical power head. I use one of these in one of my river tanks. And on the right hand side, I have a circulation pump. So the sort of circulation pump most people are probably familiar with is like Hydor, Coralia. There's a whole bunch of other ones. I think Aquion has their own line of them. And the big difference between these two is a circulation pump is just a propeller in a cage, whereas the uh, power head is actually pulling water into an opening and then um, shooting it. So the types of flow that these two power uh, that these two devices produce is quite different. The flow a circulation pump produces is a much more laminar, so it's much of a much more even flow. Whereas the power head produces a jet. And depending on which fish you're keeping, either one can work. So circulation pumps, because of that sort of more gentle flow, make it a bit easier for um, fish that are swimming up in the water column to deal with it. Whereas a power head is going to produce jets that can sort of propagate through the tank and go over rocks. And I think sort of the, the more hardcore species, some of the gobies, hillstream loaches, powerheads are a lot more fun because the fish are completely able to deal with those strong jets of water and you get some really interesting results. You can combine powerheads in particular with some fairly elaborate river tank manifolds, but it's not really necessary to have a good river tank. Some people have some very elaborate ones. What you're trying to do in your river tank is you're trying to make a gyre. 
This is sort of been shamelessly stolen from the coral reef people who use this to keep afloat in the corals, but it works very well for this one application in fresh water. The idea is that you never want to do anything to stop the water from traveling in a nice circle around your tank. And so where you position your inlets and your outlets, as well as things like power heads, should all be set up in a way to increase the momentum of the water. You want to all be pushing the same way, and that will produce a very particular pattern in your tank. And it works quite well. When I first set up a river tank, I would do things like this. I'd take a power head, and I would have the inlet on one end, and then I would run the tube over to the power head and have the outlet. You have the inlet on one side, the outlet on the other. I thought, hey, this has got to be the way to do a river tank, right? The water goes in one side and out the other. But I actually got less flow, and the flow wasn't as smooth as when I did it like this. So just by putting the inlet and the outlet close together on the tank was much more conducive to having um, one path that the water was traveling instead of lots of turbulence. Like, even though we want current in this tank, we don't necessarily want tons of turbulent water. That's going to spin the fish around. They don't really like it, most of them, some do. Um, we, we want is just sort of something the fish can predict and move around it. Like a little <laughs> and so when you're putting in power heads, you can easily put them on the other side of the tank. You just have to position them in such a way that you're going to get this circular design. And I'll show you some examples of this. So how do you stock a river tank? What sort of plants go into a river tank? What sort of fish can go in? What sort of invertebrates can go in? And are there maybe things that you shouldn't put in the river tank? So I'll show some examples here, as well as uh, some video from my tank. Mm. So plants. Lots of people here like plants. Some of our plants come from swampy areas where there's almost no flow. But other plants actually come from fairly fast flowing water. And the way you usually tell where a plant is from, or at least what sort of flows it can tolerate, is the shape of the plant's leaves. So think of a plant like a water lily, where you have a long stem and a circular leaf. That is a terrible plant for any kind of current, because the flow is going to catch that leaf and pull it away from the plant and snap the stem. What a plant wants to have is a long, slender leaf, like Cryptochorion balancei has, or like Balisneri. That's much, it's, uh, has a much easier time dealing with the flow. And so, like in the world of Cryptochorions, anything with long, slender, thin leaves is gonna do fairly well under flow, whereas things like Cryptochorion wenti, that has a thicker leaf, are gonna have a harder time. And then if we were to head over to Africa, you'll see a lot of crinum underwater. We call those the onion plants. There's various different species. And they also have fairly long, thin leaves and can tolerate flow really well. You can also go a completely different route and focus on mosses. So lots of mosses are found right at the interface between land and water in this stream. There'll be just enough in the water to get moisture, but then a little bit out of the water. And most of the mosses not only do extremely well with high current, provided they've attached to whatever you're growing them on prior to being put in the current, but you know, mosses have this tendency in most of our tanks to get kind of dirty, unless you have a shrimp or something picking it clean. So having a high flow tank will keep your mosses much more clean than they would be in a typical tank. So they tend to look a lot nicer and grow a lot better under these high flow conditions. You can also grow things like Anubius java fern bulbitis under flow. I didn't put pictures of them here because 
none of these plants actually grow underwater in their natural habitat that much. Anubias tend to grow out of the water next to the river's edge. Uh, Java fern tends to grow in waterfalls where it's getting spray, but it's not actually underwater. And Bulbitis is sort of the same thing. It's a little bit more likely to be underwater. But any of those will work particularly well. For plant, like hardcore plant attack people, if you have sort of feathery stem plants, most of those will have a bit of a harder time under extreme flow. And there is some research to suggest that rates of photosynthesis in sort of typical plants can be reduced if the current is too high. So putting plants in a river tank generally involves choosing ones that are well adapted to flow from the beginning. And we have to think about that too for fish. <laughs> like a fish that we sort of eat and know very well is salmon and trout. Um, our high flow specialists, uh, trout spend much of their lives swimming against the current, waiting for tasty things to float by. And of course, salmon are in streams um, going up to spawn. But both of these guys are not really doing anything obvious to evade strong flow. They're just sort of powering through it. And while I really don't recommend trying to keep a salmon in your tank, like, <laughs> really, don't do it. Salmonids have super high or super low um, uh, forgiveness for um, problems with oxygen. If they are sort of taken out of the water briefly for any reason, they can just die. Very hard to work with. There are some fish, including some very well-known fish in the trade, that do really, really well under these high flow conditions. And probably my favorite for this are giant danium. Yeah, they're $1.99 at PetSmart, I know, or River Street, whatever. Um, but these guys really come into their own in a river tank. In a typical tank, let's say a cichlid tank that you threw some danios in to serve as dithers, those danios are going to be about the least relaxing fish on the planet. They're going to bounce from one end of your tank to the other all day long, and it's, it's just not going to be relaxing. However, this is Daniel in one of my tanks. So this Danio is actually fighting a very strong current. You can see it's super stressed out. Not really at all. Uh, the Danios are built to withstand really strong flows. And he's having a great time. In just a second, I think you'll see one of his buddies pop over from the left. And then a rainbow fish swims by. But putting this guy in a strong current situation takes a fish that ordinarily is incredibly irritating to watch, and all of a sudden, it's actually kind of relaxing. Not relaxing for him, but relaxing for us. I actually think that these, that because they're so high energy, because they're built for flow, that they really do have a much nicer time in a high flow tank, because they can sort of let loose and really swim at their hardest without, say, crashing. How big is that tank, Matt? That's just a 40 breeder. It's not huge. Hmm. So that Danio, in the course of that video, was staying in about a sort of six inch sphere of water. He was not bouncing all over the place. All right, so that's one type of fish that does really well. If you want to really kick it up to 11, try a close relative of the Danio, um, the fish in the genus Beryllius. The sort of common name for these guys is hill trout. They're, they're somewhat infrequent in the trade. They do come in sometimes. Wet spot has had them in a few times. And if you thought danios were active, these guys like, just literally bounce off the sides of the tank all day long. So if you keep Beryllius, you have to keep them in flow. And if you want to spawn Beryllius, you absolutely have to keep them in flow. But some of them, this is a fish we think is uh, Beryllius uh, baykeri, are absolutely gorgeous. There's a, <clears throat> an even rarer one called the dragon minnow, 
from Taiwan and China. It has this elongate um, anal fin. Absolutely gorgeous fish. They've just, I've never actually seen one over here in the States. You can also try tetras. Now, a lot of tetras have very deep bodies and are not necessarily suited to endurance swimming. Fish like the Buenos Aires tetra, even though they will eat every single plant in your tank, do quite well at navigating strong flow. And I've had these in river tanks with a lot of success. One interesting thing about fish like this guy, uh, so the Buenos Aires tetras are a little on the nippy side, is that their personalities get a whole lot better when they have to spend part of the day fighting flow instead of each other. So the fish tend to behave themselves and not nip as many tank mates if they're focusing on schooling the current. If you choose to go native, there's a lot of awesome minnows, uh, particularly in the eastern side of the country, uh, that do extremely well under high flow conditions. These guys right here, and this is the natural coloration, are rainbow shiners. They're from a super exotic location, Alabama. <laughs> I mean, this is a fish that could put a neon tetra to shame, and most of the people who live in the state have no idea it's even there. And this is the spawning color, and they are just absolutely fantastic, magnificent fish. These fish, in part because they're so pretty, have actually um, been picked up by the ornamental trade. Um, so a fish that was originally from Alabama is now being farmed in Indonesia, which is kind of a fun reversal from the way it usually goes, I guess. What do they look like when they're not spawning? They're still pretty nice. So they have, even the females will sort of have this slate blue color with lots of uh, neon orange lines down the side. So even sort of before they get into spawning color, you have a fish that looks just as nice as you know 95% of all the Danio species out there. How big are they when they're adults in mass? Uh, it's about two to three inches, not too bad. This is a fish that um, pretty much anybody can keep in a tank 20 gallons or bigger. And they're around. I definitely saw them at Wet Spot last year. And, oh, at least you have some now. So yeah, they're around. And they're stunning fish. Well worth your time. But they're going to look their best in a river tank. Not cold water? They are cold water, but they, but it's more of a room temperature thing. You don't want your water temperatures going above 80, or they don't really appreciate it, which is true for nearly all the shiners, except for maybe red shiner, which are also quite pretty. Um, but really, as long as you take warm, they get <coughs> Right, yeah, they don't really appreciate it. So, so yeah, as long as you're in a, in a house where you don't have to worry about the tank temperature going above 80, these guys are going to be really great. How do they do it in community tanks? How do they do it in community tanks? Well, remember, so since this is a fish that likes a lot of current, if that sort of says some things about the way you have to put your community tank together. So if it's with other fish that also like current, they'll do fantastic. If you put these guys in a tank with sort of a little tiny hang on back on the back that's not really producing a lot of water flow, then you're going to see these guys like swimming right next to your hang on back filter all day long, like in a desperate attempt to get a little bit of water. So, yes, so they're extremely peaceful fish. They eat little insects off the surface of the water in the wild. They're not going to harass or bother anything, except you know they do like to move around a little bit. Treat this about like a zebrafish, quite frankly, and you've got the right idea. So, rainbow fish are a personal favorite of mine in stream tanks. Rainbows almost across the board do really well. The deeper body ones, like uh, red rainbows, are not quite as fond of very high flow. But, um, but that's about it. Some people, I haven't personally seen this, but some people have said that um, fish like the red rainbows, which can get this sort of grotesquely deep body as they age, like the males just um, get a little too deep of a body, 
that that's not as likely to happen in a tank with stronger flow. But I haven't seen that personally. So I'm going to show you guys some Australian marine boats of mine. I got these from Wet Spot earlier this year. And they're in the same tank as the Danios, and they all they react about the same way. In fact, if you notice, there's actually a lot of similarities between the shape of the rainbow fish and the shape of that giant Danio. They both have a noticeably forked tail. They have a slender body, but it's not ridiculously slender. It's still fairly deep. And what we think happened with rainbow fish, they're not at all related to Danios. They're more closely related to cichlids, actually, is that when the ancestors of rainbow fish invaded Papua New Guinea and Australia, or the continent that would become them, the minnow niche was totally empty. There wasn't really anything in it. And so they sort of decided or evolved into this very minnow-like shape. And so the, there's a giant danio in the background there. So we would say the shape of the rainbow fish and the Danio are an example of convergent evolution. You have a similar selective pressure, sort of swimming in a stream, producing a similar looking fish, even though the ancestors of both of those fish are totally unrelated and very different. Finally, there are a whole host of cichlids, uh, a lot of them in Central America. In fact, I think we even saw a few months ago in Ron's talk a bunch of cichlids fighting the current. This guy right here is uh, Theraps wesseli, a, um, a riverine specialist found in really strong flow. And, but a whole host of cichlids are found in noticeable flow. I'm going to show you same tank, some Honduran red points of mine that you know also look really stressed out, right? Um, they're just having no no trouble dealing with a really strong current. So this is I think the largest male I have right now. What's a gallon per hour flow? The gallons per hour, let's see. So the tank has two large hang-on backs and then a 300 gallon per hour power head on it. If you put in, it's, it's a noted, like these fish are, are very much used to dealing with it. But if I, I once like put in a few garami in the tank, these are found in stagnant water, they did not appreciate it. <laughs> All over the tank that I had to pull them out. Pass it to the back glass. <laughs> I mean, the, the nice thing about setting up a tank this way is because the flow is circular, a fish is not going to get, even if it gets tired, it's not going to um, sort of be pressed up against something necessarily. But all of these fish are able to tolerate the current really easily. Did they spawn in there yet? They haven't. They're a little, the male is about two inches, and then I have a, the, what I think is a female, the next closest is like just over an inch. So I think the female needs to get less than a touch bigger before they spawn. How did the, the rice fish do? So I have not kept rice fish in a high flow tank. They have similar shapes to rainbow fish. I would expect they would do okay. But I doubt they can handle the, uh, like a, the adult size of a rice fish is fairly small. Like a two inch one would be enormous. Whereas a lot of these danios are and rainbow fish are closer to three to four inches. So I think they can deal with current. I wouldn't put them in as much current as I would give a giant danio. Yeah. When I collected them, they were in the lake. They weren't anywhere Right. That doesn't mean they don't go that way. They were in Lake Tawudi in the tunnel. So I, I, that doesn't mean they don't live in the stream, but that was a fairly flat Interesting. The collection point for a ride, the, the collection point for the species description for a Rhizus waura, the neon blue rice fish, was in a uh, a little blue hole that was adjacent to a stream, so water was flowing out. So 
like I think they were in a little bit of flow, but not the tons. Yeah, where we were, they were in crater like I don't know if it was the same species. Yeah, I'm not sure. Looked, looked the same. Okay. But there was no obviously no parts of crater. All right. So all of these are fish that are going to be swimming against the currents. These are fish that are able to deal with it. But there's another way for a fish to make a living in a fast flowing stream. You can be a fish that hops. So in the background here is a sculpin. I don't particularly recommend sculpin as an aquarium inhabitant. Most of them have um, are not really tolerant of room temperature, let alone higher than room temperature. But there are a lot of good candidates. And why is like this a good idea? You have all these fish species that have lost their swim bladders. They now sit so they just sink in the water. And they have to hop around on the bottom. Like they look kind of cute when they're doing it, but like, you know, not <coughs> like champion swimmers either. So like why is that a good idea? A former, a former graduate student in Peter's lab during her first postdoc, uh, Rose Carlson, figured out why. So what we have here, on the left side, we have the flow speeds in a, ta in a, a tank, and then there's a piece of plexiglass on the bottom. And the redder the color, the faster the flow. And so this plexiglass, you can see the flow is pretty intense throughout. And then when you get really close, that's about half a centimeter at best, the flow decreases a little bit. This is called a boundary layer. However, if you take the same intensity of flow and you run it over small river rocks, you get a totally different thing going on. <coughs> What you can see here is there's a band that's actually larger than one centimeter near the rocks where the flow is really low. It is like a tenth of the water speed of the water higher up. And then you also have this region, this green area, where water speed is half. And what that means is if you're a fish that doesn't want to spend its life fighting the current, you can still live in a stream. If you hop around on the bottom, you can take advantage of this elevated boundary layer. And this is probably why most of the species that um, have this lifestyle in streams tend to be very small or very skinny, so they can fit inside this boundary layer and not get blown away by the current. Classic example, the classic example, of a lineage of fish that is specialized on this are the gobies. There are a ton of gobies. If you thought there were a lot of cichlids, and there are, there's 1,652 described species of cichlids. There are four times that many gobies. So there are over 6,000 little fish hopping around on the bottom without a swim bladder. Some gobies live in coral reefs, some live in other habitats, but a rather large number of them live in freshwater habitats and make their living by hanging out in this boundary layer. I've chosen one of the more popular ones in the aquarium trade. This is called the cobalt blue goby. It's in the genus Stipidon. Um, there's also a fish they call the red neon goby, um, also in the genus Stipidon. And these guys are found all across the Pacific. I think there may even be a Stiphodon species in Hawaii. And they not only have lost their swim bladder, but like all of the true gobies, their bottom set of fins, their pelvic fins, have fused into a suction cup. So they can actually stick to a rock. They can just attach with their little fin suction cup and never have to worry about getting blown away. There's no native Stiphodon. There may be a release when there's only four native. Freshwater fish and okay. all four of them gobies. Yeah. They're all in the same genus, but it's not really. Okay, in that case, the genus is Cisiopterus, right. and um, they're relative to Stipidon, but it's not quite the same. It's Concolon is probably the one you think of. Yes. The blue and yellow one. 
Yeah, it's a pretty fetish. The uh, cool thing about Stiphodon <coughs> and Cystiopterus and uh, a whole host of gobies is not only are these guys good at dealing with flow, but because of their little suction cups and some other adaptation, these guys can climb waterfalls. So you can have a hundred foot waterfall that these gobies can climb up to the top. And they do it by inching themselves up with their suction cups. And it is absolutely wild. And they do that, we think, to get away from predators. Because in the upper regions of the stream, after the waterfall, there aren't any predatory fish. Because the predatory fish can't climb up a 100-foot waterfall. <laughs> they breed up there, too. And they breed up there. Um, these gobies are what we call amphidromous. They breed in fresh water. And then the larvae are swept down in the ocean. They're, um, they grow up in salt water and then migrate back in. So, what that means is that you are probably not going to breed the cobalt blue goby in an aquarium. You can get them to spawn, you can raise eggs, and then your eggs will all die because the water is not salty enough, which is confusing until you think about where they live. This is also true for some things like a mono shrimp, where they need the larva to be swept in the fresh water. But anyways. Here's another little goby. This is one I have in uh, my tank. This is called a clay goby. And notice that his pelvic fins are not fused into a suction cup. So he is part of a family called Eleotridae, the sleeper gobies, that are um, a little bit older than the true gobies. And the sleeper gobies never evolved that fused suction cup fin. And so these guys do pretty well in my tank. They can sort of hop around and they don't, they've not completely lost their swim bladder, but they can't deal with super high flow conditions like a true goat. I can't climb waterfalls. And they can't climb waterfalls. It's a rough <laughs> life. This guy, another rainbow species from North America, is something you should try to keep at least once in your life. This is the rainbow darter. I believe the species name is Ethiostoma ceruleum. That's right. Um, and rainbow darters are found all across the eastern U.S. And they are gorgeous fish. They get about two inches long. They only live for a few years. And they really do their best in sort of room temperature water or a little colder. And with some flow. And they are, as for all intents and purposes, uh, North American goobies. They hop around on the bottom. They don't have the fused suction cup fin, but they do have the swim water loss in the same way of moving around. But gobies and darters are not closely related at all. And in fact, if you go to South America, another lineage that we don't really think of as being like gobies has evolved into a goby-like shape as well. There's a group of tetras, of all things, that are called the darter tetras uh, in the genus Charisidium. And the darter tetras look a lot like North American darters, but they're not a darter, they're a tetra. It's another example of convergent evolution producing fish on different continents that are totally unrelated to each other that look really similar to each other. The darter tetras in Africa. Yes, so another group of tetras in Africa um, has also a ball, I think it's nanocarax maybe? Uh, yeah. Um, has also evolved the darter tetra uh, phenotype independently from the South American darter tetras. And they also live in the fast flow. By the way, that, that uh, rainbow. Uh, the ETS dome? Yeah, that was not the breeding. Yes, that's an average looking one. Yeah, when they get to breeding? When they get to breeding, they're just red and blue across the whole body. Or red and green, sorry. They're absolutely amazing. And they're small, like because they're peaceful and top out at about two inches. If you have a 10 or 15 gallon tank, you can keep rainbow darters. They are in the fish trade. You can get them. Here's a cichlid from the Congo. This is Gobia cichla. This is Gobia cichla epilwinae. And it is 
then it doesn't look like your typical cichlid, right? It's long and skinny. And this one is honestly fatter than most of the cichlid I've seen. But most of them are just like little, um, very, very skinny things. And these guys have almost the same lifestyle as the cobalt bluegill. They're eating algae and very fast flowing water. And so they have this very slender streamlined shape. And this could be a pretty difficult cichlid to keep and breed. They're very aggressive, and you have to keep them in flow if you can stop them from fighting. But they are very cool. How big? Uh, the biggest goby cichlid I've ever had was just a tad over two inches. Not a large fish. <laughs> And there is, that's true. I just, I have a love hate relationship with Telios. I know, that's why I said it. <laughs> it's a, it's a real, it looks a little bit like the, um, the Gobi cichlid I just showed you with an upturn instead of a downturn mouth, a slightly larger mouth. And they're just so mean. They're just really mean fish. They like to kill each other all the time. <laughs> we did finally film them in the lab, but I had to train the fish for about three months before they would feed for us in a way we could use, which was the longest I've trained any fish ever. So, yeah. Hillstream loach. Looks a little bit like a pleco. It's not a pleco. Loach. And these guys, sometimes they're called Hong Kong plecos, um, and they're part of seven, used to just be one genus, now there's a whole bunch of them. Gastromyzon is the one we see a lot, uh, Swalia is another, or Swellia. And these guys are really, really good at dealing with high flow. They've evolved an alternate way of um, sticking themselves to rocks. Instead of sticking themselves down with just their pelvic fins, they use their uh, pelvic fins and their pectoral fins to attach to rocks. And they can deal with faster flow than you'll probably ever be able to provide them in an aquarium. I had these guys in tanks where the flow was just whipping other fish around. Even Daniels didn't like it. These guys were totally fine. They, they can be a little finicky. Um, feeding them is not always the easiest thing. Um, I had a good luck feeding them on uh, Rapashi algae gel. But, um, but they're quite fun to keep. Did you spawn them? I didn't. Mine, unfortunately, did not make it. Um, In other words, he killed them. Yes. What <laughs> <laughs> the Rapashi? <laughs> I mean, I'm not really sure what, what the problem was. The more likely culprit was probably the pH. Davis water, but I'm not quite sure. Here's another fish that planetank people know really well. Uh, we call it the Siamese algae, Crossopilus siamensis. Here's the thing. Yeah, you also have close relatives, the false Siamese algae eater, Gara, flying fox. Almost none of these are actually found with plants at all. <laughs> this is what an al a Siamese algae eater should actually be. So what this guy likes to do, he won't eat glass off the sides of the tank, but he really loves to just nibble bits of algae off of the rocks. And in fact, before I added this guy to the tank, the rocks were kind of green. And what he's doing is sort of hovering in the um, on the far side of that large rock. So he's really not having to deal with that much current um, as he sort of moves up and down. And they still have a swim bladder. It's a little bit reduced from something like a day now, so they can hop on the bottom. And you can see he's actually using both his pelvic fins and his pectoral fins to sort of prop himself up a little bit on the rock. And that sort of propping up behavior has not specifically been studied yet. So no one knows exactly why they're doing that. Maybe he's sort of looking in that little crevice to see if maybe there's some algae he missed from the last time. And uh, yeah, this is um, a good analog for the rocky streams in Thailand where these guys would be found. There generally aren't plants in those streams. If there are, they're sort of dinky little mosses. And yeah, these guys do really, really well in uh, high flow conditions.
quarries do really, really well under high flow. Almost every quarry has a really uh, short body, and they're not very tall, so they fit into that boundary layer really nicely, and they swim along and do really well. Uh, a former postdoc in the lab had a colony of pepper quarries that um, only started spawning in his tank once he added strong flow. The quarries would spend all day as close to the power head as they could possibly get and did really well. So, we've only caught them in strong flow one. What did you say? We've only caught them in strong flow one. Yeah, it's rare to find Corydoras in completely slack water. Usually, they've got some current involved, and they can use those barbels to look in between the cobbles um, and find bits of food. So this is all sort of just like the giant danio. This is a fish that most of us know very well, but you'll be maybe a little surprised at what happens when you put quarries in a tank with strong flow. All right. Um, finally, a lot of plecos, not all of them, but a lot of them are found in strong flow. And the two that the two groups that are almost always found in plow are bushy-nosed plecos, anything in the genus Ancestris, or anything in the genus Catastone. These are what we call the uh, rubber lip plecos. And these guys have a very similar ecology to that Siamese algae that I just showed you. They're in flowing water, they're eating algae off of rocks. So put them in flow and they will not be stressed out. They'll do very well. Also, this is not limited to just fish. If you're a shrimp keeper, some of us are, <laughs> then, fish <you> love. <laughs> then I highly recommend trying out the bamboo shrimp in high flow. So these are commonly sold in a lot of pet shops, and they're also called fan shrimp because their front appendages fold out into these cool little fans. And bamboo shrimp, as well as a unrelated species in Africa called the vampire shrimp, which also has these little fans, make their living by holding those fans out in strong current, letting the fans catch little particles, and then every so often they sort of fold up the fan and lick it off and put it back down to the current. So if you can put these guys under a strong flow, and feed them like baby brine shrimp or cyclopses, they'll do very well. If you try to keep these in water with no flow, the, the shrimp will starve. They don't have a way to feed. So I've been able to keep one of these alive for I think a full year under high flow conditions. And I've never been able to quite manage that in a typical tank. So I recommend giving one of these guys a shot. They're also a bit bigger than a typical shrimp. A good sized bamboo shrimp can get almost four inches. So they're a little easier to see here. Snails. Now things like mystery snails are not really found in strong flow, but nerites, nerites are. Now a lot of people use nerites to clean off types of algae that other algae cleaning crews won't really touch. And Nerites usually don't breed in your tank. They'll leave lots of little annoying eggs everywhere, but they won't actually produce baby nerites. Why is that? Well, these guys live in the exact same habitats as those cobalt blue gobies I was showing them. And they climb the waterfalls too. And they're eating algae in shallow streams. So when they breed and those little eggs hatch, the larvae get swept downstream down the waterfall and into the ocean. And then, eventually, if they're lucky, the uh, juvenile snails drop to the bottom and get to climb all the way back up. But they do very well in high flow situations, and they're one of the best ways to keep your tank clean if it's a roof. Fish not for river tanks. <laughs> Don't put your beta in a river tank. It's not going to like it. It's going to be very confused. It's going to have a hard time breathing. Don't do it. Most of the garamis, not all of them, but most, and there actually are a few exceptions even in betas, are found in water with a very low concentration of oxygen. 
The reason there's almost no oxygen in the water is because the water is not moving. And they're breathing from the surface. So when you take one of these fish that's adapted to live in completely still water, and you throw it into a flowing tank, it's not going to be particularly happy. Other good examples of fish that sort of like complex environments and slow flow are things like discus and angelfish. They can, discus and angels are found in rivers and can tolerate some flow, a little more than you might even think, but they're not a fish that really likes to be out fighting the current all day. They'll put up with a little bit of it if they have to and try to find a way to sort of place themselves in the water. But um, even some of the rift lake fish, things like Ibuna, will do really well under high flow. They have no problems. So a lot of the African lake cichlids will have no problems with higher flow. But don't go sticking a garami in there. Some of the, uh, the dinkier tetras don't also like it that much. Anything that tends to be found in sort of swampy water with a lot of plants is probably not going to be super fond of high water flow. All right, so I'll show you two of my river tanks now. The first one was a few years ago, and then the last one I have running right now. The first one is based on a Papua New Guinea stream, and it's in a 29-gallon tank. And I did something kind of interesting with this one. I took a bunch of stone blocks and I actually stacked them up in such a way that once I added river cobbles and gravel, <coughs> the river cobbles and gravel reached the top of the left hand side of the tank. It just sort of went down <coughs> that diagonal line across the tank. And so it had sort of an unusual shape to it. And I was actually able to give this tank unidirectional flow. So it didn't have a gyre in it. It had a smooth current of water going through it that didn't have any particularly problematic eddies or anything like that. The very back left corner, I had a hang on back filter. It's a pretty large one. It was uh, rated for, I think, twice the gallon into this tank. But what I did is I took the, uh, the inlet tube for that hang on back filter, and I attached a flexible tube that I sunk under the gravel along the back edge of the tank. And then right here, next to this rock, um, I put the, um, the end of that tube with a little grate to stop the fish from getting in, to stop gravel from getting pulled in. Yeah. And what that did is the water would come out of the hang on back filter and sort of flow downhill to this little inlet, get sucked in. And I kept uh, zebra danios and rainbow fish in here. We did very, very well. So this is an easy way to get unidirectional flow in your river tanks. It doesn't produce quite as strong a flow as you'll get with a power head, but if you just take your hang on back filter, take a flexible tubing, and then put your um, little inlet grate on the other end of your flexible tubing, you can have a, uh, a tank flow. And if you do a nice large hang on back filter, you'll get pretty decent flow off. The current tank I have is uh, this 40 breeder in the office that I've had running for, I think, two years now. It's sort of an interesting tank for a couple reasons. So I've got an LED light in the front just for better viewing. I also have a backlight on the tank. So you'll notice in a few of the other, uh, in the movie that's about to follow, that the tank has sort of a more vibrant blue background than you'll typically find. That's because there's actually light shining through transparent blue or translucent blue plastic to give it that. I almost never do water changes on this tank. I don't actually have to. I have a giant uh, pothos vine growing out of two hang on back filters up here. And the pothos vine gets direct sunlight for, I don't know, six to eight hours a day. And so it puts out multiple new leaves every week. And so the left-hand side of this tank is just a wall of vines taking up the fish waste. All right, so this is the full view of the tank. It's very simple. There's just river cobbles. Up in this left-hand corner, next to the two hang-on back filters, I have a power head. 
so the water is shooting to the right, and then as the water shoots to the right, it sort of goes to the side of the back glass, and then it moves um, right to left along the front and back up to the filters. And I've got rainbow fish, danios, little cichlids, and some little gobies. See, the little gobies are over here. You can see that a lot of them tend to be um, hugging the substrate a lot of the time. And the danios and rainbows are up at the front. They have no problems moving around below at all. And the cichlids are sort of hovering around the rocks, but they will come up into the flow a lot of the time. And with that, I hope I've showed you a little bit about what you can do with a river tank. Maybe inspired you to think about putting a power head in your tank and see how your fish react. So the question was, will a horse face loach do well in that tank? Yes. Um, I could have probably spent the entire talk just on loaches. Almost all of them, with just a few exceptions, are found in flowing water and deal with. A few of them are a little more burrowing, but with the exception of the burrowing loaches, almost everything else will do very well. Your current, the back. Yeah. Uh, I've got a 55 gallon that um, it, the substrate's entirely river locked. Okay. And right now I've got a bunch of uh, Tony's um, velvet, red velvet um, swordfish in there, sword tails. Uh, the filtration is a hang on. It's one that I got here at the auction. It's one of those plastic chemical jobbies. And the intake, I took a plastic tube and ran it down to the bottom corner. So what kind of circulation am I getting? Is, is, is that good for that kind of fish? All right, so you said they were, so the question was, you know, I have a 55 gallon tank with river rock on the bottom, and then hang on back filter. It's a 30 gallon tank. Oh, 30 gallon, sorry, 30. Um, with the tube sort of running along um, the back. What does run along the back, it runs inside. Inside? Okay. Yeah, it's attached to the intake. Okay. Well, you can, yeah, it runs inside along the inner edge, right? To the other, the opposite corner? No. No, it's just down? Okay. It, it's down to the corner adjacent to where it has. Yeah, so okay. it's across right. the bottom of the tank. Okay, so it's not going the full length of the tank, just a little ways, right? Yeah. Okay. So, so it's not water from a corner. Okay, so that, putting the inlet in a slightly different location is not going to increase the amount of flow the, the, the hang on back can produce. It's just going to possibly slightly alter where the flow comes from. My guess is that a small intake tube like that would not produce laminar flow, so it wouldn't produce unidirectional flow across the tank. Um, Why should I put it on the dry, a little longer tube on it and extend to the opposite corner maybe? I would either do that or just remove it entirely and just have it like a typical hang on bag. And you said they were red velvet fish, so I assume you mean red velvet sword tail. Yeah. Um, yeah. Red velvet sword tails, even though they are sort of an aquarium strain, are the ancestors of those fish are often found in the streams, not always, and can generally deal with fairly high currents. Some sword tails are found in lakes, but many of them are also found in streams and moving water. They're not that different than a rainbow fish, you get right down to it. And interestingly, a lot of people have thought for a long time that the long tail of a sword tail was a real sort of impediment to the fish's ability to swim. So like maybe they would stay out of a strong current just because of those long tails. It turns out that a lot of recent research does not really suggest that the long tail is that disadvantage, um, is that problematic for a male sword tail. They do just fine and are not particularly hindered by having that long flowing tail on <laughs> Now if you had a fish, just really quick, if you had a fish with like a long fin morph, 
that didn't just have like one long tail, like one long fin strand, but the whole tail was long, they would have a very difficult time in flow. Um, I'm planning to set up a 20 gallon tank for, for a, a vampire shrimp on Tiacamonensis. I've had some for um, several years now, and they're getting as bigger and crotchety, and they seriously need a larger tank. And uh, what I'm thinking of doing is putting up a filter, um, the, the foam filter stuff that can cover the entire inside of the tank, the space behind it, and to have a filter on that end and then send the flow either inside or outside of the tank so that it comes from the other end of the tank and is sending the water flow across <coughs> the bottom or whichever place across so that I have um, unidirectional flow. Um, can you comment on that? Do you think that's a, a good way to do that? And what level of flow for the vampire shrimp should I be considering? And if I want to put any other shrimp in there, what would be my upper limit? Okay, so let's see. So the, the question is sort of how to house, to easily house a bunch of vampire shrimp, which are those sort of filter feeding shrimp uh, holding out fans in the water column. And unidirectional flow is something you can do. The shrimp aren't going to particularly care. The shrimp are more interested in strong flow. So you can take a tank and just take a large circulation pump or a power head in sort of the back, let's say the back left corner, and that would produce a lot of current. What I think, so what you want for the vampire shrimp is you want to maximize the area of the tank that they can grab onto and that there's flow running over. So the vampire shrimp have these very sort of claw-like or fang-like legs, really. That's where they get their name from. But they don't use those legs to attack things. They use those legs to anchor themselves so they're not swept away by the current. So what you really want for something like that is a way for the flow to sort of, for your gyre to run sort of vertically. You want to have the flow coming across the top of the tank and then sweep down across the entire bottom and then back up to the filters. So the way I would do that is I would take just a suit do you have a hang on back on the tank right now? Um, I'm not using that particular tank. I have a hang on um, the one that they're in right now. I have a hang on with a fairly strong flow and uh, foam filter. Okay. That's the other form of the tank. So if you were to just take that hang on back filter and say put it on the left side of the tank so that the waterfall is essentially moving, mm -hmm. the water will be moving left to right. Mm -hmm. And then you took a circulation pump or a power head and put that directly underneath the hang on back mm -hmm. waterfall, then that was, is going to encourage the water to move very quickly along the surface, move down, and then move across the whole bottom of the tank and back up. And a setup like that is going to give the shrimp a lot of places where they can hang out and get their filter feeding done. So I'm guessing the reason they tend to get crotchety is because the shrimp know there are a few good places in the tank where the flow is high, and they sort of bump each other out of the good places. Um, it could be. I think I had two males and a female, so and once they hit about that yeah. that <laughs> size, um, I think the female killed but one of the males. <laughs> um, she would. She. I've got some driftwood in there. I now have some uh, two and a half inch pipe in there with mm -hmm. with various things. She will grab the driftwood. I mean, this, this shrimp is this big. And the driftwood is like 14 inches long and about that big around. She will throw it up in the water column and is like, I'm going that way. And she, she's pretty powerful when she wants something, she gets it. And I'm thinking she seriously needs a bigger tank because um, the, the one male who still survives, he, he, he just doesn't get in her way. And it's pretty mellow when he's around her. The other so I have a collaborator. So the, the, a lot of these shrimp are found in sort of Cameroon and Gabon. And um, I've had, I've, Friends of the lab uh, visit these places. So this is actually pretty close to where uh, where Joe Cutler was, if you saw Joe's talk. And uh, these shrimp, you can catch them in the streams, but you don't see them during the day. They come out at night. Um, during the day, they're sort of hiding in little caves. So probably another way to keep the aggression down is to make sure each one has a little cave it can go into. Yeah, I've got I've got about six caves okay. at this point, so that that did help. Have you had white clouds in your tanks? I have. So the, oh, let's see. This before it became a Papua New Guinea stream tank, it was sort of a mass random stream tank to toss fishing. <laughs> and uh, I did put white clouds in there, and they were really fantastic. 
in that tank. They were sort of displaying to each other all the time and swimming against the current. And I felt like the sort of system of taking a hang on back and then running um, the inlet to the opposite side of the tank to give it unidirectional flow sort of really enhanced the tank because all the white clouds were swimming the same way all the time and they were just really fun to watch. Did it, increase, did it condense their schooling? Or it did. It um, and I've noticed that especially with the giant danios. The giant danios don't really school that often without the high current, but if you really turn the current up, then they sort of flip themselves into a little V formation and swim around. Any other questions? Um, what, uh, for others to say, like the cherry reds or monos or whatever, do they like higher flow? And is it as high as, say, the filter feeding shrimp? So, the cherry shrimp and things like crystal shrimp are found in streams. Mm -hmm. um, there's a few found in sort of swampy areas, but mostly it's sort of gently flowing streams. Mm -hmm. So, they can deal with higher current than you might expect. I would probably use a the challenge with those guys is that they will get sucked into the inlets of um, the power heads, so you really have to cover them with some foam or a little um, foam. But, oh, what is it? I think Fluval has like a little mini sponge filter mm -hmm. that you can put over the end of that. And um, assuming you deal with that, then the shrimp will be okay. I've never found the shrimp really require or do noticeably better with special flow conditions. I usually just have large sponge filters bubbling strongly enough that there's a notice of water. Alright, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.